Kia ora guys, I'm Mackenzie. Kia ora, I'm Kia. And this is Study Times Level 3 Strategy Video for Probability Concepts. So what is included in this standard is that you calculate a bunch of different probabilities using some different formats. So this includes Venn diagrams, tables, probability trees, and then there'll also be some calculations you need to do without using a diagram, and this will usually involve mutually exclusive or independent variables. Most of the questions in this exam will be calculation based, but you can also expect some discussion questions about experimental, true and theoretical probabilities, as well as applying answers in context. In this video, we'll talk through some common questions and strategies to help you ace this exam. Let's get into it. So in understanding probability trees, there are three main rules to bear in mind. And what these are is that we multiply across our probability trees, we add down our branches, and for each singular event, our probabilities must equal one. Now, quite often in this standard, we're going to have to be working backwards. So let's take an example of this. The probability for A is going to be 0.8, and the probability of A and B is 0.2. So what we need to know is what is the probability of event B happening? Now, we can rearrange and divide, and what we get is that P equals 0.25, and this is our unknown probability of B. Like in level two, tables are often used in risk calculations. Remember, risk is just another word for the probability of something happening to a particular group. When you're comparing two risks, you can use relative risk. This is just the probability of group one divided by the probability of group two. Let's say our relative risk is 2.5. This can be interpreted as saying that group one is 2.5 times more likely to experience the event in the question than group two. So for Venn diagrams, the easiest way to keep track of everything that's going on in the diagram is to use something like color. So we would recommend taking in highlighters or coloring pencils so you can keep track of everything as you're working it out. Now, quite often what you're going to have to do is work from the inside out, and this is the easiest way to make sure that you don't make too many mistakes along the way and don't have to go back on yourself. So when you're looking in the context of the question, try to take the information that you feel like would go in the middle first. And if you can't do this, see from the context of the question and the information that you've been given, what can you figure out? Lastly, when you have finished and fully completed your Venn diagram, add up all of your probabilities within it and make sure that it again adds to one. There will most likely be a question asking whether two events are mutually exclusive or independent. These are two different concepts and students often get them mixed up. Remember, being exclusive is like saying you can't sit with us. These events can't be seen together. Two events will be mutually exclusive if the probability of both happening is zero. Being independent is like saying, I don't care what you do, I'll do what I want. One event doesn't affect the other. Uh, in order to calculate independence, you need to use the formula. Calculate both sides separately and decide whether they're equal. If they're equal, A and B are independent. If they're not, then A and B are non-independent. In justifying some of the probabilities that you'll be calculating, you have to state the assumptions that you use to be able to calculate the things that you got. So the key one that you'll almost always have to say is independence. And what this means is that you can say, um, I assumed that A and B were independent of each other, so I was able to calculate them together without any overlap occurring. Also, you're going to need to be able to recognize and know how to use the conditional probability formula. So you'll be given it in the exam, but you know how, you'll need to know how to use it beforehand and what each component of it means. Now, in recognizing a conditional probability question, words to look out for is if or given that and what this means is that it's cutting down your demographic sample already to a certain group of people and that it wants to cut it down again within that group of people. A classic question will be the comparison between theoretical and experimental probabilities. These questions will normally ask you to explain why experimental data doesn't come out exactly as expected. In your answer, you should include a statement of the fact that experimental results are affected by random chance, so they normally result in something different to the predicted results. You should also include a numerical comparison between the two prob probabilities, explaining whether the difference is large or small. You should also include a description of what could be done to compare the situation to the theoretical model better, which could include an increased sample size, for example, or running a stimulation. Sometimes a question will explicitly ask you about simulations. Simulations are basically when you get a computer to randomly generate your experiment over and over again 
and see what results you get by random chance. You can take these results and compare it to your real result to see if it would happen by chance. As well as experimental and theoretical probabilities, you might also be asked about true probabilities. The key idea here, here is that a true probability is never known. It can only be estimated by doing experiments and by doing calculations on theoretical probabilities. So a common question that is asked is to calculate a prediction, so a future probability based off the sample that you have, but then also explaining why it might not be super appropriate to do so. So these kind of questions can be good for people who understand the probability concepts but are maybe feeling a little bit shaky with their calculations. So let's take an example. So um, someone might take an average score of a class passing a certain test one year and then you might explain why it might not be appropriate to use that to uh, predict next year's uh, results and expected performance. So one problem with it might be the sample size. Was it above 30? So this is our minimum that we should be aiming for. Um, there might be other confounding variables, so a confounding variable affects our experiment and is not our either independent or dependent variable, so something like this might be the amount of study that students do prior to their test. And also, you might take into consideration changes that might happen over the years, so has the test gotten easier or more difficult? We've covered a lot in this video, but we still haven't covered everything. Remember one last tip is that if your algebra skills are a bit rusty, it's good to practice some basic rearranging and solving before this exam. Also, we recommend to check out three to four years worth of past exam papers, practice those questions, and get a feel for the format and the kind of language that you're going to be seeing in the exam. Also check out our study time walkthrough guides, which are available free online, or you can buy them in print with next day delivery. Good luck, guys.